Recording live from the Hoban Law Group here in Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Eric Singular. Welcome to the Hoban Minute. And you've got Eric Singular and Bob Hoban sitting here, going to have a little conversation uh, today on Veterans Day, November 11th. Uh, we are a week out officially from the 2020 election, and uh, while there does seem to be a winner for the uh, presidency. There's still a lot of uncertainty out there. However, one thing that is not uncertain is the green wave that we were hopeful of uh, the last time that we were here recording. Uh, we kind of went through, and Bob, I know you addressed what the uh, what was on the ballot in these, uh, I think, five or six states. One, it signifies that indeed this uh, public consciousness, this collective consciousness around cannabis legalization seems to really be catching fire. Um, perhaps that that's bolstered by the uh, economic downturn and the uh, promise that the cannabis industry offers as a economic incentivizer. Um, but I want to ask you, what, what's interesting is anytime a state legalizes, you then have kind of the creation of a new uh, state industry to some degree. So let's let's dive into it a little bit and, and talk about this green wave and, and what it means for our larger cannabis industry and the industry in each of these states. It, it's almost, Eric, like it's not fair to put these things on the ballot anymore. And, and I don't want to get cocky here, but at the end of the day, it's the polling nationally on the cannabis legalization question is always increasingly favorable towards the legalization of cannabis. Um, the sentiment from the, the public is very supportive of that. We've got a economic downturn. We've got a number of people that use forms of cannabis for medicinal purposes. Uh, the tides certainly have changed from a public policy perspective. Now, it reminds me of um, when Colorado um, passed our adult use um, um, item and it surprised then Governor Owens and also then U.S. Attorney for Colorado, a guy by the name of Troy Ide. There was an article in the Denver Post where those guys were, you know, a couple of weeks after the election, traveling out of town for the holidays for Thanksgiving, met at DIA and said, can you believe what happened in Colorado? And um, it, uh, it was surprising to those folks. It also goes back to that Romney-Obama debate here in Denver when Romney famously said in response to what do you plan to do about cannabis legalization, ask me about something serious was, was you know, roughly what his quote was. So this is serious. It's real public policy. It's real economic uh, development activity. And I think what we've seen is representative of what we're going to continue to see across this country. And it begs the question of does the federal government even – pay attention to these states that continue to legalize the cannabis plant and will the federal government respond accordingly, uh, whether that's, you know, in the next four years of presumably a Biden uh, administration or not. Now, think about that for a moment. The idea of passing cannabis legalization in some form or fashion is so overwhelmingly in favor of that that, like I said, it's almost not fair anymore. So if you have states enact these, these proposals, we're starting to see states on the East Coast one by one fall in line with their major population centers and their distinctly different differential treatment of a commercial regulated industry. Very, very different than what you've seen in most places in the Western two thirds of the United States in terms of how they intend to approach it and limit it. But I think the New Jersey marketplace is really going to be an interesting one to watch because remember, this was something that was on the agenda of then newly elected governor Murphy promising to do this when the first 100 days of office, it became a political fight. The politicians said, well, we don't want to push this. We don't know enough about it. We have concerns. Then they throw it to the people. The people ultimately validated it. And that seems to be moving extraordinarily fast. Now, the groundwork was laid, but ultimately they're moving forward with um, ways to expedite the sales process to facilitate this adult use uh, uh, system in New Jersey. That's a state that's going to make a huge difference 
on how cannabis is distributed because of its proximity to New York, its prominence on the East Coast, and its dense, diverse population. So New Jersey's one to watch. Um, what happened in South Dakota, I think, is indicative as well that this is not a party line issue. Um, when you look at cannabis legalization, it's not blue states that legalize it. It's not red states that reject it. It turns out that it's a combination of the two. Medical marijuana in Mississippi with a regulated system in a very red state as well. So we're seeing this issue uh, continue to break down the party line barriers and to just continue to be a viable alternative for drug policy reform, economic development, and just lawful regulated access, which creates revenue streams for the government, which they so, they so desperately need. You know, that's a thing we don't always talk about in COVID. You talk about the businesses that are all shuttered. But, you know, the, the, the government requires revenue, too, at all levels, whether that's public transportation system like the, the trains that are driving up and down Stout Street here behind us, or whether that's, um, you know, tax revenue to keep planning and zoning positions filled. Those numbers are down dramatically, too. So not just the private market, but the, the public sector. Governments require that tax revenue. And where what better place to get it than revenue off of willing participants as a so-called sin tax, if you will, or a use tax off of cannabis products? It's sort of a perfect marriage at a perfect point in time. Um, and I think we're only going to see this continue to increase. Heck, we've talked about this globally. Mexico is going to pass legislation by the end of the year that will facilitate a commercial regulated medical system and, and adult use in the new year. So this is a, a wind of change that's sweeping the globe. And uh, you better ask somebody if you're not paying attention to it right now. Well, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a tremendous point you just made. And I, I can relate to it personally because a couple of weeks ago, I went to the Colorado DMV on a Monday and it was closed because they had to furlough employees because of this exact reason. Our state uh, is uh, not pulling in the tax dollars. And it, it is a, it's a wonderful distinction to make because we have thought so much about how businesses have been affected in this pandemic. Uh, but let's I, I wanted to ask you, I thought about this really uh, since last Tuesday when we saw all of these states legalize. And from a can of business perspective, uh, obviously the big multi-state operators out there, the cannabis giants, if you will, the cannabis chains and retailers, were looking at all of these states, uh, probably wanted to see what was going to happen. And I, I think especially to your point, New Jersey is so interesting and such an opportunity probably to make a lot of money just given the geography and really New Jersey being the first state uh, in that mid-Atlantic region uh, to come online with an, a, an adult use market. So what happens now when a state like New Jersey legalizes? Have some of these big MSOs already been laying the licensure grant, uh, groundwork so that they could be first in? Is it? Are we going to see a lot of, let's say, ma and pa kind of uh, cannabis businesses come to fruition in a state like that? What have we learned since Colorado legalized uh, and with the industry getting bigger, more money coming in, these bigger uh, enterprise can of businesses, if you will? Just give me a sense of what happens after a state legalizes from an industry building perspective. Well, in this day and age, to your question, the groundwork has largely been laid by some of the large multi-state operators and some of the large funding mechanisms uh, they're not sitting back on Election Day and saying, if this passes in New Jersey on Tuesday, we're going to go to New Jersey on Wednesday and figure it out. That groundwork has long been laid. Uh, and a lot of these states, like New Jersey, do have a somewhat narrow, but at least a medical marijuana dispensation commercial system in place. So it's easy to sort of expand that and, 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 and move on, on top of that. But um, most of the multi-state operators – their business plan is around one thesis, one premise, um, and that is position themselves for the post-prohibition era, meaning federal government prohibition. So what they're doing right now is they're going out, obtaining licensure, building out facilities that do have sales. Of course, you need to, you need to put revenues on the books to have a viable business, period. 
But at the end of the day, they don't make a, they, they gross a lot of money. There's not great profits there because of 280E, the tax code. We've talked at length about that because of the fact that um, the cost of compliance is extremely uh, high and uh, because of the fact that um, the inefficiencies that are necessarily part of intrastate, state by state by state business um, really prevents those companies from realizing maximum potential. So their thesis is, let's position ourselves for post-prohibitionist America, and then their, the value of those companies shoots through the roof exponentially. Will we see that in the next four years? I'm not so sure we will, certainly not in the form that just makes it free and easy and allows for interstate commerce. But the interesting thing that, that goes out here is, yes, you'll have some quote-unquote mom and pops, or at least people that are more connected to communities. Some of those places tend to be in the lower income communities. There is a barrier to entry in this space. You've got to have a lot of money just to apply for licensure, let alone build it out and comply with the regulations. So the mom and pops are becoming less and less common. Um, and many of these states, New Jersey, great example of that, to comply with the regulations, to have that infrastructure, you really need to do be a really well-funded operation that's done it before. And so that is the, the trend. Look at states like South Dakota. Look at states like Mississippi, where there hasn't been a form of commercial cannabis before. Well, you're lining up at the door, and you've already got your eye on it if you're an MSO, but now you've got to wait for the painstaking regulatory process participating in that process. You lobby at the regulatory level too to have you know at least your voice heard, gathering stakeholders and getting through that process. So nothing is easy. Uh, the business in and of itself is a major, major difficult industry to operate in because of the compliance issues and just because of the sensitivity around you know maximizing yield, producing product that, that consumers will want, and making sure that uh, you know you have your marketing and, and distribution plans in place. So these are not easy businesses to run. And when you got to wait for the government to set the rules up, it um, it adds another level of complexity and, and you know requires patience. Um, but that's how I view the landscape. And there's exceptions to every rule. But remember, the MSOs are not sitting there saying we have to make. They, they obviously are geared towards making a net profit, but their hands are tied behind their back because their business plan really only comes to fruition when that thesis becomes true, that post-prohibitionist America, our, comp our company is positioned with assets that are national in scope and a supply chain. Um, and, you know, again, it begs the question when that's even going to occur, post-prohibitionist America. In, in the last week, I'm just interested, have you seen – a dollar amount that this uh, wave of new states legalizing uh, may increase the existing U.S. cannabis industry by. That's a great question. I mean, the numbers are so far over the, around, over the all over the map and all over the board. We've talked about that um, here. I think what we're uh, what we're seeing is, you know, it's predicted that the U.S. marijuana market, the cannabis market, so to speak. Is a 25 or $30 billion marketplace within the next five or six years. Well, some other organizations might say it's $11 billion. Some might say it's $50 billion. Some might include global. So my point is the numbers are on the rise. Consumer demand is at an all-time high. They're essential businesses. Uh, the stigma surrounding the use of cannabis uh, appears to be changing dramatically um, where people that wouldn't ordinarily talk about it are – are talking about it. They're using it and being open about their medicinal uses of, uh, of the, 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 the product. So um, the times are definitely changing and um, you know, we'll see how this evolves, but needless to say, if a state like Colorado with only what, four to 5 million people um, has a billion dollar plus marketplace, a state like New Jersey is going to triple or quadruple that when everything gets up and running and there's no barriers to entry or limitations to access that are predicated on specific medical conditions. So um, the dollars will only increase and it's going to the the operators will become more powerful, more influential. And something's got to give with 280E, the tax code, or else the profitability element 
is going to lack. Um, and that is something that even in a, if your objective is to wait till post-prohibitionist America, you're not going to wait that long. And on that note of post-prohibition America, uh, you alluded earlier to the fact that, well, not only uh, is he, do we presumably have a presidential candidate, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but there are likely larger fish to fry here in the next couple of months of a you know, Biden administration. Uh, what do you see? I know I think I saw there is a, uh, a vote in the House upcoming, a vote that was delayed a couple of months ago on some form of national cannabis legalization that now may be coming back around here in the near future. Is it, uh, as you look into your crystal ball, as I know you how you feel about this, but just to put it out there, you don't really think that we're going to see that in the next four years, do you? See what, out outright? Yeah, outright cannabis legalization here in the United States. Look, anything could happen, and political um, turmoil, economic distress causes politicians uh, to come up with unique things. So you never know. I mean, Eric, the fact that we're sitting here talking about state after state voting in favor of this and billions and billions of dollars worth of a, a cannabis economy in the United States in the face of federal Ill illegality, uh, it's all happened so quickly. People's minds have changed so darn quickly. So my point is anything can happen. Now, here's some hope and here's some potential reality. All right, a Biden administration. My hopefulness is that it appears that the Republicans will continue to maintain their majority in the Senate, which means Mitch McConnell and his old buddy, Joe Biden, are going to have to reach across the aisle and work together. That, in the face of otherwise what's going to be gridlock, gridlock, I think is a promising and hopeful thing. These two guys, while staunchly opposed on many policy issues, have reached across the aisle and worked with each other in the past. It's representative of a time of more statesmanship, more discourse, more compromise uh, in Washington, D.C. And I do think that that provides hope. Is that going to lead to federal legalization? I just don't think so. No matter what kind of compromise, I don't see a way that Mitch McConnell and the Republicans would support that. So in that respect, I'm hopeful that that might create cross-the-aisle opportunities, generally speaking. I just don't see it for cannabis, and unfortunately, in the next four years. Are there things that the administration can do, the presumed Biden administration, from um, executive actions and uh, orders that come uh, that are not the force of law but tell other agencies how to act? And remember this, too, by the way. Um, marijuana legalization can occur without Congress acting there's our, there are defined steps towards removing it, rescheduling it, descheduling it. All of those pathways exist administratively and from an executive standpoint. So those tools are available, but I just don't see it unless we see our neighbors to the north in Canada and our neighbors to the south in Mexico really moving forward in this industry coupled with the economic distress that continues to to hang over the United States, those are things that could cause a Biden administration to make those changes, but I just don't see them happening through Congress. No, it makes sense, and uh, it is interesting to just think about the U.S. sandwiched between two countries uh, with full legalization. But uh, just to pick your brain legally, because obviously this has been the uh, – the flavor of the last seven days is our current president filing a number of lawsuits in uh, some of the more contentious states here in the election. And uh, just from a legal perspective, what, I what are we as citizens supposed to make of these lawsuits? Do we think that they hold the kind of water that ultimately uh, shifted the 2000 election to a Supreme Court decision that ultimately chose Bush as president, or do you see these lawsuits as something that may hold up the process here a little bit over the next couple of months, but ultimately might not come uh, and elevate all the way to a Supreme Court decision that you know is uh, is 
Trump v. Biden the way we saw Bush v. Gore back in uh, the year 2000. Well, the, the, the difference, at least fundamentally, is Bush v. Gore, the number of uh, Florida was, re- it was the contentious state in that one. That was the disputed state for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, there was allegations of improprieties, allegations of fraud, something called hanging chads with these paper ballots. Um, uh, and the vote count was very narrow, though. Very, very, very narrow. Not in the aggregate amongst these states, what's at dispute, uh, which is ultimately hundreds of thousands of votes. Um, so I see the cases as different. Um, the Supreme Court, uh, ultimately, in my opinion, from a public policy standpoint, is designed to act swiftly in these scenarios and to bring certainty and, and finality to the electoral process. So if the Supreme Court is, is uh, implicated here and brought uh, over any of these decisions, I, 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 I see that as bringing this thing to a conclusion. Um, I haven't seen compelling evidence that there's been voter fraud. I haven't seen compelling evidence that um, hundreds of thousands of votes have the potential of being thrown out, which would shift the balance of the election. But at the same time, it's easy to call the Trump administration sore losers or whatever. At the end of the day, Eric, there's a, there's a legal process. And when people want to avail themselves of a legal process, that process is designed to run a particular course. In the context of election issues, it's designed to run a more rapid or expedited course to bring that certainty and finality. And so as much as it seems distasteful to not concede, if, in fact, the information that the um, Trump uh, campaign and administration is getting is that there are improprieties and they've got the resources and the desire to challenge that legally, that's just the way it goes. We shouldn't say he shouldn't do that if those are legally viable options. Put trust in the court system. I'm a big believer in that our, our United States court system is – about it's about as transparent as anywhere else in the world. I do believe that uh, our our judges work really really hard to reach a just and reasonable result, and I haven't seen anything to suggest otherwise in this context. Um, and I don't even think that Supreme Court uh, would issue a politicized decision because their interest in finality and bringing this democratic process to the conclusion is probably paramount from a policy perspective. My whole point being is it might be distasteful to some, but remember there's 72 million people out there that are not dancing in the streets because Joe Biden won. They're sitting there saying whether they specifically loved and supported Donald Trump or simply voted because they were fearful of what the Democrats would do or because they uh, just were supportive of Republican policies versus Democrat policies, that's up to the individual. But at the end of the day, don't, you, don't those 72 million people deserve this process to run its full conclusion without the media and without everybody saying, it's a sham, they shouldn't be doing this. Sure, there should be a concession. But if they really believe that there's evidence, let them avail themselves of the process. It's designed to move quickly, uh, and it will move as quickly as a legal process can possibly move. And at the end of the day, it's very likely that um, those lawsuits don't go anywhere and that Joe Biden is uh, named, not called by a network, but named and awarded the presidency, which hasn't occurred yet. Well, and thank you for pointing out something that we, I think, seldom think about, uh, which is that Donald Trump won the second highest amount of votes ever Ever. in the electoral process. And uh, to your point, there is a ton of, there's almost an equal amount of a huge amount of people out there who are who are not celebrating and i guess the one thing that you know we as we've had these discourses over the last couple of weeks and of course we were going back and forth last wednesday kind of in the wake of all of this is there's a lot to learn uh, in this election whether that be about cannabis and cannabis reform and policy kind of becoming this swelling wave here in this country whether that leads to uh federal legalization here in the near future or not definitely some lessons to be learned from that and definitely a lot to be learned in this election from so many people voting and so many people voting 
uh, for Trump as well, and not the landslide that perhaps we were uh, told to expect last Tuesday. Yeah, no, it, it's it's um, it's I, I wouldn't say it's a sad state of affairs. It's disheartening, but at the same time, politics by design is contentious. It's always been contentious. It's always been dirty. It's always been people at each other's throats. It's just there's more light shined on it because of the media outlets and the, all these sources and because people go out and seek the news delivered in a manner that suits their needs, their desires. By the way, if you haven't seen The Social Dilemma on, ne on Netflix, it's a movie. It, uh, it talks about how social media and Google searches drive you to conclusions that you already want, not answers to questions that you don't know the answer to. Uh, that's an oversimplification of the message from the movie. But my point is, that's what's driving a lot of this. And at the end of the day, you know, the top two vote getters of all time in a narrowly contested election, um, it's to be expected. Can we come out of this, though? Can we come out of this in a scenario where, um, you know, you hear this notion, he's not my president. Well, the Democrats had the right to say that. Over the, well, people have the right to say whatever they want. But they've had the right to say that over the last several years because unequivocally, Donald Trump has said these are the 50 percent of the people or these are the 72 million people that elected me and that I'm supporting. He didn't purport or pretend to be the president for everybody. That is a notion that that Biden has thrown out there. Let's give each other a chance. Let's try to repair this. Let's try to I want to be everybody's president. Yes, it's political speak. Uh is he sincere? Perhaps. At the end of the day, at least those things are being said so that, you know, Donald Trump was not those people's president because he didn't want to be the president. He didn't even try to advance things that were, you know, on bad. At least we have the specter of this. So I hope, I'm hopeful that the Democrats don't just uh, ruin this process by going out and overnight trying to just overturn every single thing that President Trump did so that, it is. Uh, it just angers the other side. I hope it becomes a more uh, open and honest process with dialogue, but that could just be wishful thinking. There is something to be said for Trump's honesty and transparency, for better or for worse. But, Bob, it's always a pleasure to analyze all of it with you here on the Hoban Minute. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hoban Minute. Do you have any ideas for episode topics or guests? We would like to hear from you. Reach out to us at media at hoban.law and stay tuned for more on the Hoban Minute.